we're gonna, I'm uh, very pleased to kick things off in the infection session for the first half of the morning. I'm happy to welcome our friend and colleague, Kevin Winthrop, who's visiting us from the Pacific Northwest. Kevin is a, a professor of infectious disease and ophthalmology and professor of public health at University at, at um, uh, Public Health at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. And he is an expert of, of many things across infectious disease and in particular uh, infections in the setting of uh, immuno compromise uh, infection prevention and vaccines in immunocompromised hosts, which is what we've asked him to uh, talk about today. Uh, Kevin has uh, many collaborations in the infection space with rheumatology and really is an honorary member of the rheumatology community. And I could say a lot more, but I will, I will bring him up to talk to you about infections and in, in, vaccines and immunocompromised. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Gus. Okay, thanks guys. Um, yes, it's a privilege to be here. I haven't been here since the pandemic, so it's really nice to come back. And uh, Len did just recognize his slide template that I've, he gave me about 15 years ago, I think. <laughs> and I still use it because I love it. Um, and I've had the good fortune to collaborate with Len for, for a long time, starting when Cassie was like in high school, I think. But now, and now getting to collaborate with Cassie is, is a real pleasure. So uh, I, wanted to mention some things about the guidelines and some of the nuances uh, that uh, Len and I had the good pleasure of being on the guideline committee. Uh, we published this last year and it was an update. There's several important updates, but I wanted to give some of the data behind some of the updates and really just um, get you thinking about what's next. So some of this is very practical and some of it's uh, theoretical. Uh, first off, about influenza. So I'll hit the big vaccines here. I'm not going to talk about COVID vaccines because uh, the speaker later will cover COVID vaccines. So this is everything non-COVID. This is 2019. Um, so we kind of debated and hemmed and hawed for years about whether we should be giving high dose or adjuvenated influenza vaccines to patients. And there's a number of studies that kind of uh, trickled out the last few years that, that showed that uh, people who had rheumatic disease had higher levels of seroconversion or seroprotection uh, if they were given the high dose. So you can just look at the uh, H3N2 responses here in the high dose group. You know, protection was about 50% more, 49% versus 31%. You can see that for the other two groups. So this is one of three studies that all showed the same thing. And it led us to make a very definitive recommendation that from now on, if you're immunocompromised and you're an adult, you should get a high dose vaccine. It's not just for older people over 65. And so I think this was an important uh, recommendation that was made. So unfortunately, I, I will show you some, so I'll give you some of my, my thoughts on the flu vaccine. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> this is a major unmet need in our society. You can see the, the various ranges of effectiveness here. And I also point out my my friends at CDC where I used to work, they, they pulled a fast one here, like a US world and news report kind of uh, um, figure where where they where they look at the it's zero to 70. So you know that really should be zero to hundred. So they've made the vaccine look actually pretty visually effective by just you know carrying their Y axis to 70%. So if it was up here, you'd actually see that. Uh, it's pretty pretty low. So this sleight of hand uh, kind of hides the about 30% effectiveness that is on average yearly. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's just with infection. I think what we learned with the COVID vaccine is, you know, trying to build expectations early on that it's going to be, you know, really effective against regular just infection. And I think the story moved eventually to being effective against serious infection or hospitalized infection. The same thing is true of, of flu. We're, we're trying to now spin the story that, well, here's ICU associated flu. And if you're vaccinated, you know, the protection was greater than 50%, it's about 60%. So there's a number of studies like this that really speak to the fact that even though the flu vaccine might not keep you from getting the flu, it will help diminish severe outcomes. That being said, um, there's still, it's just not good enough. And it's hard to convince people to be vaccinated, particularly when there's there's a lot of studies out there that, that show this phenomenon. So here's the deal. 
just look at, uh, it doesn't matter, check out the California one here. So this, these are antibody titers, HAI, so hemagglutin titers, which are protective. You know, we have a level of protection that's pegged to, to the HA rise after vaccine. These are people who got vaccinated uh, last year and this year. These are people who skipped last year and they got vaccinated this year. So everyone's been vaccinated last, this year, but this group skipped last year. And you can see they have much better responses. It turns out if you skip a year, you're much better off. So I actually skipped, what, 2020 uh, during the pandemic because I figured there's going to be no flu this year. There was zero flu. So I feel really protected right now. <laughs> but uh, this phenomenon not just bleeds, it bleeds into cell mediated immunity too. I just wrote it there. But CD4 responses are muted, which probably leads to the, to the muted antibody responses. And so we've, we've been, uh, you know, we kind of tricked ourselves getting into this annual flu vaccine strategy, and it's probably also not the best strategy. You do gain a little protection every year, about 20%, I just showed you, when you, when you vaccinate. But if you skip a year and you just stay home, you're, you'll do better the, the following year. Um, this is an interesting study that was uh, out there. There's a number of studies like this as well. Speaking to, this explains why my wife never gets flu, she never gets vaccinated, she never gets flu. I always get flu and I get vaccinated. This explains why. She has all this cross-protective T-cell responses. This was a cohort of like 1,500 people that they followed forward a few years ago. And uh, the ones that got flu versus the ones that didn't, so PCR positive flu, they compared the, the two groups. And what they found was uh, if you had CD8, primarily CD8 responses against the nucleoprotein, which is a is a part of the flu that we don't ever think about or talk about, but it is cross-protective again, you know, it's there in all the different um, antigen types of flu. But if you had this type of cross-protective immunity, the, the odds ratio was 0.27 of being infected. So it was strongly protective. And again, the bulk of this was CD8 immunity. And here's these other proteins that measured CD4 um, and other cell media response against. But suffice it to say, you can see the same data with COVID too. T cell responses are extremely important. And so when we think about the, the protective benefit of flu, no one ever talks about T cell responses. Um, so I think COVID has kind of taught us that we need to be thinking more broadly about uh, vaccine induced immunity, and it's not just about antibody levels. So I don't know where all this is going other than we will have new flu vaccines soon. This is a Pfizer mRNA construct for flu. That um, you know, there's a number of these studies out there too. Moderna has one. There's there's multiple mRNA vaccines in the pipeline against flu, but they all share the same thing. You know, really uh, robust T cell responses, both both CD4 and CD8 responses, as well as robust humoral responses. So, you know, how cross specific these will be. Some of these vaccines are being built to be much more cross uh, protective against different flu strains. Uh, than others. So we'll, we'll have to see where this goes. But I think in five years, we're going to have better flu vaccines. That's my, my, my call. So uh, let's talk about your DMAR management in the face of uh, vaccination. So the other thing we recommended in ACR was holding methotrexate for two weeks at the time you give the flu vaccine. We did not give that recommendation around any other vaccine except for the COVID vaccine, which was that recommendation was given by a task force. But those are the two vaccines where there's actually data to support holding uh, methotrexate for two weeks. This was the original study uh, that I had the pleasure of helping Yoon Bong Lee and his group in Korea do, where uh, we actually looked at two, two weeks versus a four-week hold. And then we did a second study, and this is the data from the second study, looking at a two-week hold versus no hold. And so you could see the people who held the methotrexate did better. It wasn't shockingly better, but they had another 10 or 12 points or 14 points, percentage points of being a responder, meaning they had a protective response develop. Um, <clears throat> here's the data in COVID. I'm sure uh, Al will probably show you this later today, but there's numerous studies supporting the idea with the COVID vaccine, and it was primarily in older people where you really saw this uh, difference between people who continued to methotrexate with much lower responses versus people who held the methotrexate at the time of vaccination. So uh, do you need to hold it for two weeks? Well, the longer you hold it, the higher risk there is of flare, of course. So this is RA data, and 
This was actually our original study. I mentioned the two week hold versus the four week hold. And you can see with the four week hold, a lot of people flared. It was about 20% in the first four weeks after vaccination versus a two week hold where it was only about seven and a half percent. So this is what led to the original uh, two week hold recommendation. Now I will tell you, we just published uh, this study and it was presented at ACR last year prior to publication. Uh, comparing one week hold versus two week hold. So we're getting, you know, we're getting very granular here, but the bottom line is one week's good enough. And when we looked at antibody titers after flu vaccine, these are geometric fold increases. They're about the same in both a one week hold group and a two week hold group. So, uh, and then the flare rate you can see was much lower with one week versus two weeks in this cohort, four and a half percent versus 12%. So, you know, functionally, this is all you have to do. If your patient comes in, it's time to give them a vaccine. Just give it to them and tell them don't take your methotrexate for the next seven days. So, so a lot of people will end up being held or stopping the methotrexate for somewhere between one and two weeks. And the data would suggest that that's good enough and your risk of flare is fairly low. So that's the, that's the answer. Plug them with your vaccine, tell them not to do it for a week, and then they're good to go. Now, does this bleed over to other vaccines? We don't know. Um, there is no data with pneumococcal vaccine. There's no data with other vaccines other than COVID and flu. I suspect that holding methotrexate probably helps all vaccine responses, but suffice to say, there's no data yet. And that's why we didn't give recommendations for other vaccines in the guidelines, because there's a lack of data. <clears throat> Rituximab, uh, we... A kind of a confusing recommendation around rituximab. We talked about just don't worry about rituximab, just continue it, give flu vaccine, uh, or just give any vaccine because because it kind of does matter. Because if you're on rituximab, it's not gonna work. And that was that was basically our, our guidance. So I, I like to talk about you know this this dosing interval, and this is pretty clear. This was actually COVID vaccine data, mRNA data, but you can see that you know no one really responds until about at least six months out from the last dose. This is the number of days here. So you can see this, these people are about six months out and you start to see a percentage of responders. This is humoral response. Now it turns out some of these folks, about half of them have a reasonable cell mediated response on the first go around, which gets better with boosting later. But suffice to say, if you're looking at humoral outcomes, Really, uh, anyone who's gotten retoxin in the last six months is going to have very minimal activity. So the idea is to wait as long as possible. Um, and we kind of made this recommendation around flu, like saying, oh, well, it's flu season. You better just, you better just give them the vaccine when they walk in. And I don't care when their last rituximab was. Well, I, I actually think you should be more nuanced. You should vaccinate as late as possible. You should know your own epi. So, for example, in Oregon, flu season doesn't start till the end of the year. I don't vaccinate any of my, any of my patients till mid-November. In the Southeast, you should vaccinate your patients in mid-August because their flu season starts in September. So depending on where you are in the world, you kind of have a sense of when you need to be vaccinated. So if you have a patient who's you know four months out from Rotox and it's a few months before flu season, I would wait. I would wait. I'd wait to vaccinate them till the end of their, their rituximab cycle. And then you don't want to give rituximab for at least two weeks after a vaccine. So just keep that in mind. So functionally, what I do is I have people come in on month six, actually the day they're supposed to get the rituximab. I tell them to hold the infusion. I give them vaccine. I have them come back two weeks later, and then they uh, start the rituximab again. Prednisone, we made an issue about uh, well, there's two things here. There's low dose prednisone and there's high dose prednisone. We talked about deferring vaccines if they're on high dose prednisone, if you can, until they've dropped their dose. Because there is good data in people, particularly from a lupus setting, people who are on 20 and higher, they have less response. I will say low dose prednisone, there's a plethora of data showing that doses below 10 really don't do anything to your vaccine response. Uh, numerous studies have looked at most of these people are on five or seven and a half megs per day but it doesn't affect your vaccine response. So you, I think you can feel very comfortable with that. Um, Vax, I, I just talked about this. Here's, you know, this is the Southeast, that's where it starts. But again, know your epi and you can better time your vaccines for your patients. So let's talk about pneumococcal vaccine. There's, there's something new here to talk about. And as usual, pneumococcal vaccine recommendations are confusing and kind of don't make sense. But here's the deal. If you're immunocompromised, you should get it. This has not changed. This has been the recommendation for a while. 
We have a new vaccine, the PCV20. So this is replacing Prevnar 13, which we used. We had Prevnar 7, or maybe they didn't call it that, but we had PCV7 in kids, and then we started using adults. Eventually, we had PCV13, the same thing happened. Now we have PCV20. So this is uh, 20 serotypes of pneumococcus it covers. So it's almost uh, up to PPSV23, which is Pneumovax, which is our polysaccharide vaccine that we've been using for years. So um, this was a study looking at PCV20, compared that strategy once compared to being given PCV13, followed by a Pneumovax, you know, eight weeks or later, which is what we've been doing the last five or six years in, uh, in, in America in the rheumatology setting. And the bottom line is, I'm colorblind, so it doesn't matter. I, I can't really tell you what's what, but it doesn't matter. They're all the same. The strategy is equal in terms of your antibody responses at certain time points after uh, vaccination. So the new recommendations are basically just use PCV20. <laughs> I'm trying to make it easy because because if you read between the lines, it gets it gets a little uh, hard to, to think about. The alternative strategy is PCV15, which I haven't told you about, but there's also PCV15 out now as well. So PCV20 and PCV15 cover more than 13, of course. If you go with the 15, you should follow with the Pneumovax, just like you've been doing with the PCV13. But the data I just showed you should make you comfortable just using the PCV20. There are some immunocompromised experts friends uh, that say, well, why wouldn't you just use PCV20 and then follow it with the Pneumovax? That would probably be better. That, that's being tested. That is probably going to be better. Um, so we'll see. But for, suffice it to say, until there's data, using PCV20 in someone who's naive is pretty easy. So a new patient walks in the door. They just developed RA. They're 40. Give them PCV20. If they've already had Pneumovax, given PCV20 a year later, if they've already had PCV13, which a lot of your patients will be in that group, they just had it in the last few years, well, then, you know, if it's been a year or longer, give them PCV20 as their booster, and then they're done. So that, that's probably the bulk of your patients. They're either new starts, and you're going to give them PCV20, or they're people who've had PCV13 before, probably along with Pneumovax, because that's what we've been doing, and then you just give them the PCV20. Now, if they've been fully vaccinated, PCV13 with the Pneumovax, you know, eight weeks or longer later, they've been boosted, then, then the recommended interval is you don't need to do anything about it unless it's been five years. And then you give them the PCV20. There's a lot of stuff over here I'm not going to go through because option B is just too, too confusing. It doesn't make any sense. So we have no data on PCV20. We have no data on PCV13 in terms of uh, with DMARDs or in the immunocompromised setting necessarily that you, that you guys care about. Uh, we do have some PCV13 data, which uh, this was a study that we did using tofacidumab. You can see really, really high responses here. Uh, most people had excellent responses. This is a younger psoriasis cohort, however. No one's on methotrexate. No one's on prednisone. So it probably explains why the responses were so excellent. We did the same study with baricidinib a few years later. And what we did see, we saw fairly good responses, but the geometric fold rises here, which looked fine. You know, if you compared it to that TOFA study I just showed you, they didn't, they didn't look as good. Why? Probably because older RA, methotrexate, uh, almost everyone here is on methotrexate and berry. So just a different population. So I, my interpretation of this data was that, that these geometric full rises were, were quite good, actually, and certainly better than what we would have seen with Pneumovax um, years ago. Uh, last one I'll show you. We, we did the same study with UPA. We just like to do the same studies with each compound. Uh, it's important to do, though, because there are differences between some of the JAKs, as you guys are aware. So... Uh, this was UPA 15 and UPA 30, and you can see that the response is about 65% or 60% of people had uh, good responses at week 4 and week 12. These are quote-unquote satisfactory responses, meaning their GMFR rose twofold or higher. And actually, uh, again, we saw that people taking steroids um, actually did better than people not taking steroids. This is not statistically significant, but again, it just plays into my comment before that low-dose steroids don't seem to affect um, vaccine responses. Uh, okay, the last section is zoster. Uh, 
people who are over 18 immunocompromised should get Shingrix. So this was data Jeff Curtis and I produced, I don't know, 10 years ago or nine years ago, because we were angry, well, we weren't angry, but we were upset that people who had Im immune mediated inflammatory diseases weren't getting shingles vaccine uh, when they should be. And we were able to show that at lower age groups that people had much higher risks than healthy people who were quite a bit older. So uh, by disease bucket, you can see compared to a healthy control, you know, some of these groups of patients, most of which are yours, lupus, RA, PSA, AS, they're two to threefold higher risk of shingles than the general population. So enter Shingrix. This is the tree outside my friend's house in San Francisco. This is the plant. It has a soap bark. Uh, this is a soapbox tree. It has an adjuvant in it that's extremely powerful. And when you marry it to the uh, glycoprotein from the virus, it, it produces really robust immune responses. This data just came out, and it's very impressive, actually, that this is 10-year data. Now, this is not an immunocompromised patients. These are the general healthy population. These are people that were vaccinated in the original ZOE phase three trials 10 years ago. And if you look at them 10 years out, they've really maintained very uh, high titers of both uh, antibody and um, as well as CD4 responses. So this is year five, that's year 10, year five, year 10, roughly. And basically, there's very little drop off in the five to 10 year range. Um, this translates to really prolonged efficacy. There is some drop off. You can see it. Here's the year one efficacy was about 97% and it drops off to 73% at year 10. So again, healthy people, but this is pretty, pretty robust and long-lived immunity. So maybe there'll be a recommendation at some point to give a booster. But again, I think the situation is very different for your patients where we really have, we have no data still in RA, PSA, AS, you bet. In all your conditions, we have no data. So uh, except for the data these guys <laughs> produced a few years ago that I'll show you in a second. There's five immunocompromised population studies with Shingrix. And here's one of them. This is our people with cancer. And if they were on chemo or not on chemo, you can see the ones on chemo had much lower responses than the people um, on chemo. So uh, clearly the chemo was suppressing their immune system and they had less robust responses. So if you look at the five studies that have been done, and none of them have done in your population, they're HIV and cancer essentially, uh, in transplant, you will see diminished responses. So how well the vaccine works in your group of people, we don't know. This is the only actually immunogenicity data that's out there. It's still not published, although I did see it as a referee uh, floating around out there. So it, it'll probably be published soon. But it was people on TOFA primarily. And you can see that this group of people, here's pre-vaccine, post-vaccine, they have pretty good responses. These are the healthy controls. So for two thirds of these people, their responses look just like the healthy controls. The problem was about one third of people had these very flat, really no responses. And I think that's the great mystery. Who are those people and why are they not responding to the vaccine? Uh, so we need more data. We're actually contacting everyone in this room to help us with the study. <laughs> so be aware. But uh, we we're starting a very large study looking at patients on JAK inhibitors as well as TNF blockers to see how uh, Shingrix per, uh, behaves or performs in that setting. Uh, here is probably the, uh, there's only a couple studies published. This is the best one. This was uh, by your group here. You guys did a nice job looking at, it wasn't an immunogenicity or an efficacy study. It was simply a safety study where patients were looked at post-vaccination. And actually, uh, you know, the, the issue of flare was addressed. And the big question was this adjuvant and this vaccine is, do people flare their RA or other inflammatory disease when they get it? And this, this study suggests that there is an increased risk of flare, and that was related primarily to increased disease activity and the use of steroids at the time of vaccination. So there was, I think, what did you guys find? Like 24% of your patients with uh, RA flared after getting the vaccines. That might be kind of high, but that's what was observed. And so I do think there is an increased risk of flare. So just be aware when you use the vaccine, um, that might happen. I can tell you that even if you don't have immune-mediated inflammatory disease that the risk of just feeling like crap 
uh, is, is very high for, for 24 hours. I think a lot of people are used to that now because a lot of the COVID vaccines were quite reactogenic. So I think it's helped people maybe tolerate this vaccine, but uh, I can speak from personal experience. It can be hard to tolerate for, for 24 hours. So take some uh, ibuprofen when you get it. Um, vaccine coverage, this is a moving target. So really in the last three years, we've done much better. This was 2018 to 2023. This is market scan data. So about only about 13% of patients in the country uh, who are younger than 65. I mean, if you generalize market scan to the rest of the country, clearly these are patients who should all be getting vaccinated. This was 18 and above immunocompromised, actually inflammatory autoimmune disease. So it includes IBD, et cetera. So we're, we're not doing that well. In older people, we're doing much better now. We're almost up to 45% uh, of patients in that age group who are eligible for vaccination are getting it. So uh, we are catching up. I mean, that's, a, that's been a lot of catch up in the last three or four years. Uh, but it's, you know, it's important to note that still half the patients in the country who are over 65 uh, should be getting this, or have still not gotten it. So in conclusion, shingles prevention remains a high unmet need. I already mentioned the study we're doing, but we really need data. And other than the flare data that was generated here, we don't really have much in the way on how best to vaccinate these patients? Should we be holding the JAG inhibitor? Should we hold the methotrexate? There's lots of questions around DMARDs and how best to maximize uh, vaccine responses. Uh, the new pneumococcal vaccines, we need, to, we need more study there too, but we need to adopt them and figure out how to use them. So I think those recommendations I just showed you, they'll probably change in the next three or four years as more studies come out. So for right now, try to make it easy and just use the PCV20. Uh, and then, Again, lastly, more work on the hold versus continued DMARD story. So with that, I thank my colleagues and I thank uh, the Cleveland Clinic for having me and uh, I'll take any questions now or maybe later during the round table. Thank you. Thank you. It's refreshing to have a infection talk that's not about COVID, but Time is up and we're gonna switch gears and have a, a couple of talks on COVID if anyone still wants to hear about that. Um, I think as they pull up my slides and talking about COVID moving forward and immunocompromised hosts, which I think this talk is timely given the ending of the WHO and US government emergency relief plans for COVID in the past days and week. Um, many think the pandemic is over and COVID has left us. This is not the case, um, but has created some confusion. The ending of the WHO plan essentially means it's not felt that there needs to be a, a united international effort or funding uh, against COVID and has moved COVID into our repertoire of kind of regular bad things trying to kill us from a from a very bad thing and then the ending of our own government's plan has created a, a, a bit more confusion but really means moving for a more government-centered effort to a commercial effort and in particular less data tracking especially on the community level uh, no more free tests etc although um, there is a, a large plan to keep uh, vaccines and treatment free for the uninsured, so they say. So let's begin. COVID is, is not left us. COVID is still here for our patients. And how do we approach this moving forward? So little whirlwind about COVID at 30,000 feet, how the pandemic will end for our patients, who are the immunocompromised, perhaps the biggest gray area in question, who is at highest risk, um, what are their risks, and what is the optimal strategy or care path to protect, prevent, and treat these patients when they get COVID. We can't give a talk about COVID without showing this slide. This is our vision of idealized course of SARS-CoV-2 infection going through three stages, stage one, asymptomatic or posse-symptomatic, uh, innate immune system activation going on to non-severe COVID uh, with adaptive immune activation. And for the most cases, infection ends here. And for an unfortunate, uh, about 20%, this is pre-Omicron, go on to stage three 
um, severe COVID hyperinflammatory response that in pre-Omicron era was uh, fatal in one to two percent. Of course, things have changed and we'll talk about that, but we've learned a lot about risk factors for severe COVID in the general population, which age is number one, remains number one, immunocompromised state, of course, which we will talk much more about, and then all these other, you know, traditional comorbidities listed over here on the right. This figure depicts uh, risk factors associated with severe COVID, increased risk of death from COVID. As you can see on the left side, age is just tremendously impactful with this risk increasing significantly with age compared to uh, comorbidities. But on the right, you can see as uh, comorbidities are additive, the risk does increase. But we're here to talk about immunocompromised persons of which 3% of the population are immunocompromised. So this is not, not small numbers and immunocompromised state is very heterogeneous. We have uh, solid uh, tumor patients, hematologic malignancies, patients with solid organ and hematologic transplants, uh, untreated HIV. And we are interested in, in this box here are immune mediated inflammatory diseases or IMIDs which within have varying levels of immunosuppression and span many different image subspecialties, rheumatology, neurology, in particular multiple sclerosis, IBD, um, and others, as you can see here. And then, of course, uh, inborn errors of immunity, what we used to call primary immunodeficiencies. So this is the, the group we are talking about. You've all seen this. This is the CDC definition of immunocompromised, and this has been used to indicate who needs uh, management or prevention from COVID, whether, you know, extra vaccine or antivirals or uh, PrEP with tixagevimab, silgevimab. And we've been critics of this definition since the start of the pandemic. If you haven't seen this, you can read here. It's very uh, long and vague and really includes everyone on from hydroxychloroquine to cyclophosphamide and really isn't doing anyone any favors and helping triage who needs, you know, aggressive outpatient management or a prep. Um, so this is one of the, the great challenges of why many are confused, both patients and practitioners, of who's at highest risk for COVID and, and how to protect and treat them. This is a very helpful and impactful figure from the IDSA that kind of shows the spectrum of immunosuppression and many layers of risk including age and comorbidities, and, and then on the bottom are our spectrum of immunosuppression with things like TNF inhibitors being on the left and B cell depletion being in the very higher risk category. And this is really how we think about our patients when we're talking about who's at highest risk. This is just a couple studies showing pre-Omicron that our patients with IMIDs or immunocompromised do worse in terms of severe COVID hospitalization and death. Um, There's an Israeli study, a U.S. study, and some ASIP data showing that our patients are, are very overrepresented in hospitalizations and death uh, pre-Omicron. This is a, a more a very recent very well done study, um, a population-based study looking at relative risk of hospitalization from breakthrough COVID in groups of patients that they have dubbed clinically extremely vulnerable, or CEV, uh, compared to patients who are not clinically extremely vulnerable. And they have three groups by level of immunosuppression, group one being the most severely immunocompromised, including transplant, and group two. Uh, B cell depletion and IEI, and then group three kind of non iatrogenically immunosuppressed high risk patients, and look by vaccine number of doses received and age. And as you can see, as you move to the left, um, the hospitalization rate, as expected, really uh, climbs by age uh, as in these groups. And this is this was done I think the first half of of 2020, but I think this is very uh, impactful. So our patients are at risk uh, for severe outcomes, in some cases increased incidence, and 
I will let Alkim talk to us about decreased effectiveness of vaccines, but these are, are the issues. So what is the future of, of the pandemic? It's still here. It's unlikely to, to fade away. It's going to still be here and be a problem, especially for our patients. And we really see it morphing into two epidemics, an epidemic of immunocompetent vaccinated persons and an epidemic of you know, highly immunocompromised persons and unvaccinated persons in there as well. And moving forward, what should be our strategy to educate patients, educate practitioners, and have a care path to protect and link these patients to treatment? This is kind of what we envision that looks like, and I am going to spend the rest of my talk focused on the left hand of this screen, finding the right care path. So as you all know, as I've already said at the start of this talk, COVID is ever changing. Things I you know, say today will be very different next month or even next week. And speaking to that, this is the monoclonal antibody story, anti-spike monoclonal antibodies for treatment of COVID, which at Varying points during the pandemic were available for every indication crossed out uh, in yellow on the right hand, but it shouldn't be all at all surprising that given the heavily mutated B and T cell epitopes of the Omicron subvariants, all of these products um, are not effective against Omicron and therefore we have currently no available treatment product. This is depicted here um, graphically. These are, this is from the New England Journal, uh, now many months ago, looking at highly mutated Omicron subvariants VQ1 and XBB, and a variety of the different anti spike monoclonal products, including PrEP products, which we'll talk about. And they're just here to show that there's uh, very little to no efficacy against Omicron subvariants. This right shift on these graphs indicates that. Perhaps the highest point of the pandemic was a, a IM anti-spike monoclonal antibody given as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP in the form of tixagevimab, silgevimab for immunocompromised and high-risk patients. This was a, a game changer for our patients and this was given emergency use authorization in December of 2021, uh, for adults and children who are not expected to have mounted a proper response to the COVID vaccines due to being immunocompromised or for people who have severe you know, reactions or contraindications to the vaccine. But this is not a substitute for a vaccine. We uh, do not have this product available anymore either due to loss of effectiveness against Omicron. Um, but the concept remains important and there, there will be more prep products down the road. This is our early experience with tixagevimab, silgavimab as PrEP in our highly immunocompromised patients on B cell depletion across specialties, including neurology and rheumatology, as well as patients with inborn errors of humoral immunity. These are all the patients we gave PrEP to in the first half of 2022 at the Cleveland Clinic a little over 400 patients, and then looked at breakthrough COVID, which through the first half of 2022, uh, about 3% of them uh, had uh, breakthrough COVID. And they, if you can see on the right, they all fared very well. One patient was hospitalized and did not require oxygen. Um, but these patients also, on the bottom of the a list on the right, received either oral antivirals, uh, monoclonal antibodies as treatment or both, which is standard of care for uh, a B cell depleted patient who has breakthrough. So can't attribute all of the effectiveness to, to PrEP, but this was, was very, very important. And while this, when we had PrEP, this is how we approached uh, triaging and prioritizing who should receive tixagevimab, silgavimab, and we do feel strongly that this requires some thoughtfulness, especially given the CDC definition of who they think qualifies for PrEP that I showed you earlier. And this was increasing importance when we had uh, allocation issues and you know not a whole lot of doses, which toward the end was not an issue at all, but still B cell depletion 
with rituximab uh, at the top, first and foremost um, associated with very um, poor COVID outcomes of all of our drugs. Um, so across specialties, neurology, uh, hematology, really even if their last dose was a year or two ago, solid organ transplants, of course, stem cell transplants, active chemotherapy, uh, anaphrolimab, a type 1 interferon receptor blocker, which we've, you know, talked a little bit about this meeting, is increased risk of viral infections nat naturally, including zoster, and severe COVID. Cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, anyone with inborn error of humoral immunity, and then uh, some categories that really require um, physician, you know, uh, best decision depending on uh, comorbidities, combination of comorbidities, combination of therapy um, could warrant PrEP. And what perhaps even more importantly, we've learned who does not really need PrEP in terms of iatrogenic immunosuppression. We use patients on, you know, methotrexate monotherapy, most of our other oral DMARDs, TNF inhibitors, all these other cytokine inhibitors we use for psoriatic disease and, and spa, of course, hydroxychloroquine, et cetera. So this is, this is how we approach this. And this is what's coming down the pipeline. This is the supernova trial that is currently enrolling patients to receive a new monoclonal PrEP product compared to tixagevimab, silgavimab, and they are enrolling only immunocompromised persons and anticipate to have this product available sometime in the end of the year. So we are hopeful, and there will be many other products such as this, so we're hopeful for that. Convalescent plasma um, became increasingly interesting to us throughout the pandemic. This is pooled plasma from people convalescing from COVID and um, is increasingly interesting to us, although there have been many studies since the start of the pandemic with differing results, many negative, often because the titer wasn't high enough or was given too late uh, or both, but there are data to suggest its efficacy in, in highly immunocompromised patients with uh, protracted COVID or prolonged COVID, as well as um, early on in disease in high-risk patients. And this is most interesting to us and of increasing interest because the pool from which this plasma is now collected from shows increasingly robust immunity from persons who were vaccinated and had COVID often from multiple different strains. I'll now talk about antivirals, which are currently really the only tool in our toolbox to treat outpatients with uh, risk factors for severe COVID. This figure shows the viral life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 and the two targets of the currently available oral antivirals on the left. Um, the protease inhibitor is nermatrovir, ritonavir, or Paxlovid, and on the right, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is blocked by molnupiravir. Fortunately, unlike the spike protein, these uh, are very preserved and relatively resistant to mutations, which is why all of the antivirals we're using currently are still effective. Nermatrovir is the most commonly prescribed oral antiviral. It was given EUA in December of 2021 for patients with my, uh, moderate risk of, um, or monitor sorry, mild to moderate COVID and who are high risk. And this was data from the EPIC HR high risk study. And I'll say this study and others I will mention for the other antivirals, these were done in unvaccinated persons, you know, early on in the, in the pandemic. But when given to patients with out within five days of a symptomatic COVID who had risk factors for severe disease, decreased risk of hospitalization and death by over 80%, which is significant. So it has to be given early. There's a time-sensitive window. It's highly effective if done so. Uh, however, there are many significant drug interactions that often confuse its use or preclude its use. Um, the IDSA has a very nice um, online tool that kind of uh, triages 
interactions of significance at the top are neurooral anticoagulants and antiarrhythmics and some drugs that you, I can't use this um, uh, oral antiviral with, so that is, is a challenge. There is, for those reasons, some confusion and uncertainty about giving neuromatural vigor to patients these days. Do they need it? You know, Omicron's less severe, um, or they have drug interactions, or they'll get rebound. So this is some real-world data of use of neuromatural vigor in the Omicron subvariant era. This is a large um, Colorado health system study looking at patients who got neuromatural vigor in the Omicron era. And while the, you know, primary outcome of hospitalization and death was low, this still was effective in reducing risk of hospitalization and death in high-risk patients, even in the Omicron era. Um, a couple months ago now, the, uh, there was an FDA hearing um, where Pfizer uh, proposed for full FDA approval of neuromatrovir, and um, if any of you caught wind of that or didn't, they actually, their most recent clinical trial, which was EPIC SR for standard risk, which included patients with no risk factors for severe COVID who were unvaccinated, as well as vaccinated patients who had one or more risk factor for severe COVID receiving neuromatrovir. They actually stopped that trial early because the primary outcome was so low in the standard risk group. Um, but this is still, you know, has a role for our immunocompromised persons. The less exciting oral antivirals, molnupiravir, which received EUA around the same time and has the same indications and same time-sensitive window. This is the move out trial, which was also done in unvaccinated persons. I should also say that these studies also included very, very few immunocompromised persons. Um, our patients are heavily underrepresented in all of these trials, and we feel that these drugs are all probably more effective in, in our patients. It just weren't included in these studies. As you can see, the relative risk reduction of severe COVID was only 30%. Um, so this remains an option and often used, you know, if neuromatural vir is, is not an option due to drug interactions. This is some more real-world data on molnupiravir. This was the panoramic study. This is a, a multi-centered study in the UK where they looked at um, patients who got molnupiravir versus usual care, versus usual care alone, and looked at hospitalization and death. And you can see here that their uh, primary outcome was less than 1% in, in both groups. So it had no impact on uh, morbidity. Was the primary outcome was so low compared to on the bottom of the slide. This is a, a study by Sun et al. in the pre-Omicron era where you see 24% of immunocompromised patients um, with COVID, breakthrough COVID, were, were hospitalized. So times have changed. However, from that study, there was a significant decrease in, in symptom duration. Um, and this uh, shows, so their symptoms improved on average 4.2 days quicker in the Molnupir group, which is not insignificant if you think of our use of oseltamivir and influenza. This is significantly quicker time to improvement, so something, something to think about. Um, while there was no impact on mortality, there was on morbidity. This is graphically depicted here in this tweet from Paul Sachs, which if you're on med Twitter and don't follow him, you should. Excellent um, way to stay up to date with uh, COVID. And we say that, you know, this pandemic and the fast moving nature of the pandemic really lends itself to following on social media and med Twitter and peer review is often not adequate. Um, so follow Paul Sachs. This is an excellent, um, a, a nice, a very nice early study. One of the first studies showing um, impact or benefit of aggressive outpatient management of patients with systemic rheumatic diseases receiving treatment. And this was done um, by Zach Wallace from the Brigham, which if you were here on Thursday, heard him speak and Jeff Sparks um, at, um, He's at the Brigham, Zach's at Mass General, and this was about 700 patients, and they looked on the right as subgroups of different uh, outpatient treatments, monoclonals, 
antivirals, and we can see it's all left shifted. All these patients had decreased um, severe COVID outcomes. On the right, this is showing by time, increased uh, prescribing of all of these treatments. So this is important. This uh, reaffirms what we experience in our own clinical practice and our um, thoughts that these patients warrant aggressive early outpatient management. This was retrospective. There need to be you know, larger prospective studies, but this is important. As I mentioned earlier, um, the end of all these uh, emergency relief plans has led to some uncertainty and, and confusion. This is uh, Helio Rheumatology, another great source for COVID information um, with quotes by Janus Yazdani and Al Kim, whom we'll hear from very shortly, essentially saying, you know, things are, are going to be a little confusing for our patients in terms of access um, and payment for um, treatments, vaccines, et cetera. Another figure shown by Paul Sachs here, it's all about the virus, Omicron and Omicron subvariants. While they're you know, less severe and things look better for now, that doesn't always mean mild for our patients. This is another nice study by Zach Wallace and Jeff Sparks looking at trends in COVID outcomes in systemic rheumatic disease patients by um, variant epoch and by vaccine status. And they showed that over time, uh, the severe COVID outcomes did decrease in Omicron in patients with systemic rheumatic diseases, but were still significantly elevated. However, that risk was attenuated by vaccine. So again, more information to support our, our thoughts that our patients need aggressive outpatient management. This is a CDC figure. I put this up here to show how there have been a paucity of helpful patient education materials throughout the pandemic, which is kind of an, another um, weak link in this optimized care path. This is catering to immunocompromised patients and tells them to get vaccinated and open their windows. But, you know, this little asterisk at the bottom saying there are, you know, are treatments, but doesn't mention, you know, broadly what they are or that there's time sensitive window to talk to their doctor about them. So I think there's room to improve here in terms of patient education. Calling the right care provider is important and also a weak link that we have observed in our own experience. We did um, a, a retrospective study looking at COVID outcomes in B-cell depleted patients and, and throughout all that chart review, the patient identifying and calling someone who knew how to help them was the weakest link in that study. And our patients have many different doctors and often don't know who to call, and that is problematic. This is I think, one of my second to last slide to shout out this study going on at Scripps. This is uh, Immunocare. This is, uh, they're enrolling over 10,000 immunocompromised patients and looking at a different care paths for linkage to treatment. They're looking at patients who will test positive at home and be linked to a formal outpatient treatment care path versus standard of care. And we're very interested in this. And this is just an example of a, a care path for immunocompromised persons, um, which I think is, is very important. So um, that was all I had. We will save questions for the end, our panel discussion. We will carry on talking about COVID. Um, Len Calabrese is going to tell us about long COVID, something he's been heavily invested in in the clinical and, and research space, and I'll say no more, and there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as Cassie said, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the issue of COVID-19, uh, you know, for the majority of the country is uh, looking Promising. Uh, it's no guarantee of future returns, as they like to say. Um, but there are some elements of this um, that are just really getting started. And uh, I'm going to address this issue of long COVID, um, which is uh, 
far closer to the beginning than the end. Um, my in industry disclosures, my real disclosures. Uh, I don't get many more Twitter followers out of this meeting. It's be very disappointed. So, uh, and uh, what Cassie said about Med Twitter and uh, COVID nineteen is axiomatic. Uh, I, I really don't know how to keep up with things. And it's the only talks that I think that e either of us have ever given where we embed tweets in the. Uh, uh, because that's where things are first seen. So long COVID is a complicated topic. It's a very controversial topic. It's a, in evolution. I'm going to break it down and trying to define it, uh, talk about its epi clinical endotype, make a few passing comments about immunopathogenesis, uh, delve into some of the controversies and, and where we're going. Uh, there have been a number of conferences on this. Uh, ranging from you know, those in patient groups to high power science. There'll be a Keystone Conference this summer. Uh, it's a very fast moving field. So everyone understands this is uh, what happens to people with uh, COVID-19. Cassie's already run through this. You get the infection, most people get better. Some people get really sick in the hospital, but unfortunately a lot less. And then, well, you want to recover. That's what we do for uh, respiratory infections, that's what we understand. But the recovery phase is different in everyone. And, um, you know, some people uh, have uh, rather uh, uh, come from stage two. We understand that. You're in the hospital, you're in the unit, you're on a ventilator. It take a heck of a long time to get better. It's, it, it's part of our, our granular understanding of illness. But one over here are people that get uh, mild COVID, as Cassie said, posse symptomatic, and according to some people, asymptomatic COVID, um, and wind up at the other end with sequelae, which are conditions that are the consequence of previous disease or injury. What does that look like? This is where we're headed for this. Now, the Achilles heel of all long COVID research at the present time is the lack of validated classification criteria that allow um, comparison of uh, epidemiologic studies um, uh, from uh, within a country or across the world and uh, are really limiting um, our ability to do high quality uh, clinical trials on emerging therapies. The World Health Organization is perhaps the most commonly engaged definition of long COVID. And it basically says that you had COVID-19 and then by three months, um, you're still having some symptoms. And those symptoms could have appeared immediately with your COVID-19 and persisted, or within that first three month window have arisen um, and then uh, last at least eight weeks and extend over that three months period of time. Now, the weakness of this definition is that it says that these symptoms, uh, while well, they have uh, uh, newly arisen, um, uh, are not specific. And it can be any symptom that is not, quote, medically explained. You, know, you haven't had a stroke and have a weak arm. Uh, you didn't have uh, myocarditis and have congestive failure. Um, uh, obviously, the most common symptoms um, that are, are uh, elucidated uh, have been talked widely at this meeting and will be talked a, a lot more this afternoon, which include fatigue, um, uh, respiratory difficulties, cognitive dysfunction, uh, and I could add sleep disturbances and pain to this. And the number of symptoms um, is not uh, indicated by this definition. Now, I want to do a big shout out for this paper. I think it's one of the most important papers of the, of the uh, pandemic, certainly in 2022, um, uh, by the Yale group. And it, uh, in Nature Medicine, High Power, basically makes the case that we should not be surprised that um, unexplained post-acute infection syndromes have been recognized uh, as long as uh, uh, medicine has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, codified and, and recorded. And uh, these post-infectious syndromes um, differ according to pathogens um, and have many similarities to what we're seeing in the long COVID space. 
Now, this is a, a, a high impact publication, and, and I, I keep forgetting uh, th this is a, a, a nature uh, publication. Uh, the figure was very eye catching and makes the point that this was a meta analysis of about 50 studies, and the circles uh, indicate the uh, uh, frequency of symptoms that have been ascribed using uh, this long COVID definition. And as you can see, most patients have something that looks like pain, cognitive dysfunction, varying sources of pain, whether it be headache or musculoskeletal, um, intercurrent mood disorders, GI disorders, um, uh, 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 and beyond. Um, to capture these uh, type of symptoms, uh, which uh, uh, in the end of the day must be medically unexplained. We often rely on quality of life measures. And as uh, we like to say, um, it is difficult to separate these out from the substrate of daily life because all of these symptoms are experienced in, in all of us. And I'll come back to that. I, I'm, I'm being very measured in my discussion of this. Um, uh, I, I am all in to long COVID and the study of long COVID and caring for long COVID, um, but this is the biggest challenge uh, defining this. I like to think of this as non-syndromic and syndromic um, manifestations of the disease. So the non-syndromic uh, are those persistent symptoms I've related um, that have defined pathology, you know, from these really sick people um, that fail to recover in a quick period of time. I will not discuss those. Syndromic um, long COVID are persistent symptoms without defined pathology, or at least understandable pathology. Um, and these are what we talk about for long COVID or long haulers and beyond. So what is the epidemiology of long COVID? Well, I've outlined and inferred there are many challenges. If we don't have a unified uh, 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 definition that's acceptable by all of us, it's very hard to uh, put exact numbers on this. Rheumatology, we, are, we should be leaders in this because we have been, uh, you know, we have classification criteria for numerous diseases that are poorly explained. You know, Sjogren's syndrome, uh, lupus, uh, 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 fibromyalgia and, and beyond. Uh, this is not yet, this rigor has not been applied to this at the present time. Um, many of the studies that describe long COVID have variable evidence of infection, ranging from PCR positive to self-report uh, without um, uh, testing. Um, no diagnostic biomarkers. And I put an asterisk to this because I've been, I've been pilloried on, on Twitter uh, for saying uh, this. There are tons of data uh, on hundreds of biomarkers out there, but they are not validated against a codified syndrome at the present time. So just because uh, there's an interferon signature in some patients and um, uh, uh, EBV uh, at reactivation in the acute phase in other patients and microclots in other patients doesn't mean that that's a test that you can order to separate out disease and non-disease. Then finally, the study designs are... are uh, radically different. And um, uh, much of the most uh, publicized studies rely on um, uh, culling uh, the EMR, uh, you know, passive surveillance, which I can't see uh, can add uh, virtually anything to this at the present time. Uh, we have an ICD for long COVID, but I'm not exactly sure who to apply it to. And I'm sure that the vast majority of people uh, who are uh, encoding for this um, uh, have a lack of confidence in that as well. However, let's take something that we can at least define. This is the Pulse Survey from the Census Bureau, and uh, it uh, uh, asked people, um, did you test positive, uh, and this is uh, done on a repeated basis uh, to millions of people, it says, have you tested positive for COVID? Um, and uh, do you have symptoms uh, for three months after COVID that you never had before? I understand what that is. So if you do the math over here, and these are kind of conservative figures, um, it said uh, that, you know, we figure that half the population and probably a lot more have had COVID-19. And if you um, ask people who have been diagnosed with COVID, um, it'll say that 28% of them have had some symptoms that persisted greater than 12 weeks. And that at the time of the Pulse survey, about 6% 
were currently experiencing some type of symptom that they ascribed to their COVID-19. And about a quarter of them said that it really affected their quality of life. I, I understand this. So what, whatever this is at the present time, um, there are several million people that have significant impact on their life that have had an infection, that feel that this was unexplained, uh, it was new onset, and that is a serious uh, setting. So if we take that as a starting point of what the, the, the large outline of long COVID is, what are the risk factors and endotypes? This is just a summary slide that I keep adding on. You know, if you have COVID-19, uh, the risk factors are being a little older, over the age of 40. Women, two to three to one over men. And that's an interesting observation. The severity of uh, the acute uh, COVID-19. Uh, oh, there's another uh, typo in there. It may, uh, it, you know, I'm notoriously dyslexic, and I've showed this slide 100 times, and I just uh, saw this, so uh, it's okay. Um, having a more severe disease is a clear risk factor. Um, uh, uh, some uh, debate on um, uh, social determinants of health, but I think it's a positive risk factor. And then your state of health beforehand. And you're protected if you're young, you're healthy, uh, a more ideal BMI exerciser, um, a milder infection. Vaccine, I think unequivocally, people have uh, less incidence of uh, long COVID-like symptoms. Um, limited data on previous infection. I think growing data, Omicron being milder, makes sense. And then use of antiviral therapy and some other drugs that I'll talk about in a moment. Unknown at present, um, and uh, some uh, uh, data could be coming out in Lancet Rheumatology in the next month. If you have an IMID, uh, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, uh, IBD, uh, multiple sclerosis, beyond, are you more or less likely to get long COVID? And if you have it, or is it more or, less, more or less likely to be more severe? And does it look any different than the general population? Here we are into this. We cannot answer this at the present time. So if you take this large group, there are certain clinical endotypes that have come out to, uh, of uh, studies that have uh, tried to uh, use uh, statistical mo modeling, uh, machine learning to correlate symptoms that I think are worth a few comments. This was one of the first efforts of uh, using uh, machine learning that uh, created a group of endotypes, um, whether it was primarily cognition, pain, breathlessness, um, uh, dysautonomia, uh, headache, and, and beyond. And uh, what it, my summary of this is, is that most of these, regardless of which endotype, except for anosmia uh, discusia, which is uh, virtually uh, gone away, um, uh, uh, accentuate uh, musculoskeletal pain, sleep disturbances, um, fatigue, and neurocognition. That is the core of, of, of symptoms. Now, having said that, um, you know, people that understand post-infectious sequelae and people that have paid attention to this field recognize that this is not new and that um, Long COVID has many similarities to what we now, um, uh, in, in acronym form, refer to as ME-CFS. That's chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, uh, I, I won't go into its derivation, but everyone understands that this is a condition that prior to COVID-19 was marginalized, uh, is still poorly understood. Um, uh, patients uh, were derided. Uh, um, uh, most infectious disease doctors would never see them um, uh, because uh, they didn't, but it, for whatever reason. Uh, and now um, I think that there are some things that we must uh, relearn about this. So in 2015, the Institutes of Medicine um, uh, created a, 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 a classification criteria that said that you had to have fatigue for uh, you know uh, six months. Uh, um, it was always attended by unrefreshing sleep. You didn't get a good night's sleep and just feel like a million bucks. Post-exertional malaise, which will come to again, the, where routine activities far below the threshold of exercise that you're used to can um, uh, cause people to crash and burn uh, either immediately or in a delayed fashion. And this is something that rheumatologists, we don't include in our review systems, and now uh, I think it deserves to be discussed. 
And then finally, um, either neurocognitive dysfunctions or signs or symptoms associated with dysautonomia. Um, many studies have been done that have looked at these criteria now within the confines of, oh, and I don't have this. I, I, uh, uh, the best study right now uh, just came out from Stanford um, uh, by Hector Bonilla. Uh, and in, in a very careful analysis of the first 150 patients uh, that have been seen, this is a biased population. They made it into the long COVID clinic. Um, nearly 50% met the IOM criteria for MECFS. Now, selection bias, but what we're saying, the patients with the worst manifestations of long COVID um, have uh, features uh, uh, that are very consistent with uh, a, a disease that has been around and is still poorly understood. A second uh, clinical endotype is dysautonomia. And I find this um, uh, uh, very interesting, um, uh, very scary, um, and poorly unexplained. Um, dysautonomia, uh, 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 particularly in its fully developed form with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, is seen both as a sequelae of vaccine as well as infection, but the infection outnumbers it by about 500%. So the risks of this, we do not understand uh, the mechanism of this. Uh, as I'll get into patients uh, with uh, post COVID states, make multiple antibodies, uh, many of them to G coupled protein receptors on cell surfaces. This has been incriminated. Um, uh, our our uh, POTS clinic uh, has waiting lists in years, not uh, weeks. Um, and uh, I was talking to Dr. Azar at the vasculitis uh, um, uh, summit uh, uh, on Thursday and uh, said the same thing at Hopkins. So this is something that we have to understand. We know that patients after COVID have higher heart rates for, uh, for months. Most of this is asymptomatic, but this is probably its most fully developed form. Rheumatologists need to talk about this and the field of long COVID needs to understand that there is a extraordinarily um, strong relationship between fibromyalgia, which this afternoon at the pain conference uh, will probably be referred to as nociplastic pain, which is what the pain people now refer to uh, fibromyalgia syndromes. Uh, in, in multiple um, uh, 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 areas, um, fibromyalgia as a post-infectious sequelae has long been uh, described uh, studies from Australia, the Dubo study, uh, almost 20 years of age, show that it can arise from uh, viruses uh, 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 such as uh, 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 Ross River, um, uh, from uh, 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 Coxsackie, from, uh, uh, from uh, other non-viral pathogens uh, as well, uh, uh, including um, uh, Borrelia. Um, if you think of uh, fibromyalgia, it is characterized by uh, fatigue, pain, uh, sleep disturbances, and neurocognition. Um, 70%, 50 to 70% of patients who meet IOM MECFS criteria have uh, criteria for fibromyalgia. And I have been to two major uh, long COVID conferences. Um, where this word was never uttered, not one time, not, not even uh, mentioned. Um, uh, next month in, uh, uh, in the Annals of Rheumatic Disease, Dan Claw and I have a commentary on this. So as I wind up in this, uh, let me make a few comments about uh, pathogenesis. There is uh, some brilliant work going on uh, uh, on uh, trying to understand the pathogenesis of patients who have long COVID. And regardless of how it is defined, these are people that just don't feel well uh, afterwards. Uh, many um, uh, uh, hypotheses uh, for varying degrees of evidence have been put forth. Uh, everyone is aware that there are data that in some patients there's evidence of persistent viral infections, whether it comes from postmortem studies or finding a uh, spike in the serum or um, a virus uh, in the GI tract uh, many months later, up to a year later. Um, whether this is live virus, whether this is incomplete uh, uh, proteins uh, is unknown. Um, it is not found in all patients, and in fact, it's found in the vast minority, but uh, it is spurring on uh, rationale for antiviral trials. Inflammation. You know, when I talked the other day about inflammation ranging from 
low grade inflammation to cytokine storm. Uh, there is perturbation of inflammation in long COVID, uh, but if you look at IL-6 levels, you know, normally we circulate in one to three picograms per ml. Even the studies that have shown statistically elevated levels are showing really in the, in the region of two to five picograms uh, per ml. This is not a cytokine storm. Whether that's a treatable target remains to be seen. Um, reactivation of, of other viruses, EBV reactivation in the acute illness, I think bias towards people with who are really sick uh, may be a, a, a indirect biomarker of this. Microbiomic changes have been identified um, a, a year and a half later, and there are numerous nutraceutical uh, uh, trials that are, have been launched. Probably the most controversial and interesting is the presence of microclots, I'll show you in a minute, uh, made the cover of the National Geographic. And there is no doubt uh, unequivocally, that after COVID-19, there is an a, uh, anti-self response with numerous autoantibodies. Um, and, and these are just the things that are at the top of the list. Um, I show this one paper because we're rheumatologists. I think this was very cool. So it just came out a couple months ago. And you can um, look at these heat maps, uh, which are showing, um, which looked at sub categories of ANAs. All right, so you take all the ANAs and uh, nucleoproteins and DNAs and things that we have looked at. Um, and then you look at a, a group of patients here. Um, uh, and um, uh, these are patients that were healthy controls. Um, and you can see that, yeah, you know, people have some ANAs of some specificity. We know that young women do this. This is of people who have recovered from a non-COVID respiratory infection. These are people that had mild to moderate COVID, and these are looked at um, uh, 12 months later, 12 months later. And if you get down to here, these are people that survived hospitalization um, after COVID-19. Um, and these are people that survived hospitalization that were in the ICU. You don't have to be a statistician uh, to see uh, that they, you generate these autoantibodies. And people like Aaron Ring and uh, PJ Utz and others have looked at um, uh, far more, looked at thousands of autoantibodies using, uh, you know, these broad uh, uh, antigen agnostic techniques and have shown the same thing. What people don't uh, talk about in the same breath as this is that the data from Stanford also showed that if you're in the ICU with anything, any illness, and, uh, and you adjudicate uh, with several ID docs uh, saying, did these people have an infection or did they not? Or were they in there with a crush injury or this or, or, or a hypertensive shock? It doesn't make any difference. If you're sick enough to be in the ICU, in the months afterwards, you make, you make autoantibodies. So the question to me is not whether this is good data. It's very good data. Um, are these the passengers or the drivers? And uh, uh, th this is where the talk gets loose when you're talking about long COVID. So I've given you enough stuff. Now the debate comes. And, uh, you know, uh, there are patient advocacy groups over here who I have profound empathy for who are clamoring for help. Um, uh, and there are people now on the other side uh, that you're starting to see blowback. Um, <clears throat> Uh, some uh, 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 describing this as a, a whatever a psychosomatic Ill illness is these days, um, uh, and that uh, accusing people of exaggerating this um, uh, very burdensome um, uh, uh, illness. Remember, over half the country has been infected with this. Um, uh, in terms of treatment, what can we uh, say about it? Uh, well, it. it top line is that there are no specific therapies. Um, and the model of treating are these multi-specialty COVID clinics, uh, which are uh, 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 doing a great service for people who can access them. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, kind of starting point of how to get people back uh, has revolved around some type of rehabilitation. And the uh, uh, College of uh, Rehabilitative Medicine has put out some really good works, and I'll talk about pacing in a minute. 
Um, psychologic support is important for people not only with neurocognitive complaints and intercurrent mood disorders, but people trying to deal with the uncertainties of this. We don't cope with what we don't understand very well. Uh, there's a small pipeline of drugs. I'll talk about a few things. Um, and uh, 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 I, I think that the ascendancy of integrative medicine here is very important. Uh, I, I did a poll the other day at CCR East. I said, how many people are familiar with the notion of pacing? And uh, about 10% of people uh, raised their hand. Uh, pacing is a, a form of physical rehabilitation that has been codified and applied to patients with ME-CFS, uh, which is the opposite of graded exercise. You don't start on the treadmill this week at two miles an hour and go to two and a half and then to three and to four and increase your time progressively. That's a training effect. That's what healthy people do. A personal trainer beats you and makes you do this. Doing this in uh, patients with ME-CFS phenotype causes post-exertional malaise and puts them back not only to the beginning, but below the beginning. And there have been clinical trials, and there's still some debate over uh, uh, the, the, the validity of pacing versus graded exercise. But the, the MECFS community is uh, very uh, 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 adamant about this. And uh, this is a handout uh, from the, uh, uh, the NHS and UK uh, that I give to every single patient with long COVID. And it teaches lifestyle. It's an empowerment program. This can be accessed um, uh, online, PDF. I give it to everybody. This is a, a chart from a recent uh, narrative review by Eric Topol um, in Nature Reviews of Microbiology that just shows um, uh, potential treatments. And he starts out uh, uh, that this group, which has uh, scientists who have long COVID, um, that uh, pacing is the initial um, treatment uh, paradigm for patients with this. And you can talk to physical therapists in your area, or particularly if they're associated with one of these clinics, they will be doing this. People who have POTS, and uh, particularly those that have positive tilts, um, they need to be managed by people who can do this. And that ranges from you know, easy things like beta blockers uh, to uh, far more sophisticated approaches. Um, there are a variety of treatments aimed at this immune dysfunction. Um, uh, 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 ranging uh, from uh, 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 targeted therapies to targeted synthetic therapies to a wide variety of, of uh, other biologic therapies, uh, um, uh, which include PLEX and IVIG. Uh, it's, a, it's a wild, wild west out there. Um, patients who have the um, uh, fibromyalgia phenotype, um, uh, we're going to hear a lot about that this afternoon, the pain session. I'm so excited about this, uh, to have Dr. Warek here. Um, uh, 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 they need an integrative approach. Um, the, the antiviral protocols, uh, which have been talked about for uh, a year, still aren't off the ground um, and uh, uh, probably will be by the end of the year. Um, uh, and so these are just a few things that we... Um, are thinking about at the present time. Um, some very interesting uh, uh, work going on, I must say. So uh, what do people get better? Uh, some very interesting um, uh, uh, data from Kaiser uh, Permanente uh, Health Group. I think that the answer is that the vast majority of people who have long COVID improve over time. And this is looking at um, uh, declining uh, morbidity with this. But there have been several studies that I uh, uh, have cited here that show that if you meet MECFS criteria, that puts you probably at the upper five percentile of this, you do not do well. And, and I, I have seen people from all over the world, uh, I've seen MECFS for, for decades, but uh, in the wake of COVID, uh, this is a, a, a sad and terrible and tragic uh, phenotype uh, that we don't have easy answers for, and uh, they, they need a lot of this. So can it be prevented? Yeah, I think there's some good data on this. I mean, you, you know, you don't get COVID, you don't get long COVID. Um, uh, so primary and secondary prevention, we encourage it. I, I said, I think that the data uh, that vaccinated people uh, have a lower incidence of this is real, 
if you, and it makes sense if you buy into the fact that the more severe your COVID is, the higher your risk of long COVID. Well, if you're vaccinated, you're going to have less severe COVID. And then early antiviral therapy, growing uncontrolled data, uh, but I tell people, you know, I, I think that there's enough data here that I'd take it uh, if I get it again. Um, and then some a recent, a very interesting study by David Bulwer uh, uh, on uh, a randomized controlled trial of metformin, the new wonder drug, uh, which is used for everything now from osteoarthritis to anti-aging, and uh, uh, had a 40% reduction in long COVID in a, in a, a double-blind RCT. Um, so I end with this. Uh, I, I wrote this with uh, Luana Coloca, the, the great uh, placebo uh, scientists um, at the beginning of, of COVID-19. We knew, we knew less about long COVID than we know now, which is saying quite a bit. Um, uh, that, you know, you could come away from this discussion saying, well, we don't know anything about long COVID right now. It, there's more questions than answers, which is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that we can't help people the way that we help people with many of our diseases, which are poorly understood. You know, I don't understand exactly why your joints are no longer tender or swollen, but you still feel lousy. That's uh, uh, Dr. De Silva, that, uh, his talk yesterday, you know, the discordance between how people feel and what we can see with our objective eyes. So much has been said, the, the word empathy has been used multiple times in this uh, conference, and you're going to hear a lot more about it this afternoon, is that, you know, just hearing people um, has a salutary effect. You know, it's not telling them that they don't have anything or it's all in their head. Uh, so uh, empathic communication, validation, expunge them of guilt. You know, my doctor said there's nothing wrong with me. Go back to work. Um, um, dispelling people's feels, uh, fears. And as we work with our patients always, you know, to establish that working relationship. Um, and, you know, when, when people, you know, I don't have anything more to offer than anybody in this room uh, in terms of an armamentarium of how I manage this. Um, but, uh, you know, when you create a, a, a bond over a, a, a challenging condition, I think that makes uh, both pi uh, parties feel better. So I end with our with our usual slide um, by dipping into the COVID river, uh, which Heraclitus said that no man ever steps in the same river twice because he's not the same river and he's not the same man. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's the deal. So thank you very much. Thank you, great. Uh, we'll round up this session with Al Kim talking about COVID vaccines in immunocompromised hosts. Al gave a excellent talk yesterday, so you all know him and why he's not here, and we're very grateful he will be joining us uh, in spirit through recording of his talk. Um, Al's an assistant professor. Uh, in Division of Rheumatology at Wash U. He's been very active in the COVID space, in particular COVID vaccines, um, including one of the earliest studies demonstrating the impact of our immunosuppressive medicines on COVID vaccine responses. So that we'll be pulling up Al's recording. I believe he will be joining us for discussion after his talk. So I want to thank Dr. Calabrese, uh, both Len and Cassie, for the gracious invitation to speak today on the topic that has consumed my life. I hear him. So I want to thank Dr. Calabrese, uh, both Len and Cassie, for the gracious We'll get there. presentation to speak today on the topic of examining the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in immunosuppressed patients with rheumatic diseases. These are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to this talk. So while we'll focus on the next 20 minutes, our updates regarding the immunogenicity of mRNA vaccines in the most vulnerable patients that we see, specifically those on B-cell depleting therapies and mycophenolate. 
I'll just I'll address two questions within the B cell depleting therapy space. First, when is the best time to administer SARS-CoV-2 vaccines relative to the last dose of uh, B, uh, B cell depleting therapy administration? And then the second one is, what about T cells? Um, do T cell responses occur? Are they functional? And importantly, could they protect against COVID-19 by themselves? <clears throat> then we'll uh, briefly shift to interesting data in the solid organ transplant world that likely has implications for those on mycophenolate. Can you break the cap and induce robust immunity in uh, these patients with additional doses of vaccine? Then I'll wrap up with the discussion about a population that we, we don't typically think of in terms of high risk of poor vaccine responses. Uh, these are people on TNF inhibitors. Uh, as you'll see, this particular scientific vignette is not a complete story yet. While present today are closer to open-ended observations with a clinical impact that's a little bit less clear. Uh, things that I won't be explicitly uh, discussing today are going to be durability of antibody responses post-vaccination and the question to hold immunosuppression and peri-vaccination, although I'll be more than happy to address this during the question and answer period. So <clears throat> by now, the risks immunosuppressed patients with immune-mediated inflammatory diseases have of developing attenuated human responses following SARS-CoV-2 vaccination are well described. This is a reference, reference list in the bottom right that only represents about a tenth of the high-quality papers that have uh, shown importantly that most immunosuppressed people can mount decent humoral antibody responses within the first several weeks of the second dose of a uh, vaccine. Um, the risk is not uniformly distributed amongst the various classes of immunosuppressors that our patients take. Uh, rather, uh, B-cell depleting therapy, mycophenolate, glucocorticoids, and JAK inhibitors confer the highest risk of acute uh, poor antibody responses post-vaccination, and in that order. Uh, the second important point that I won't explicitly show data for is that, in general, neutralizing antibody titers do correlate pretty closely with total anti-spike IgG titers in most medication classes examined. I'll talk about an exception later, though, with TNF inhibition. The generally good immunogenic response to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in our patients appear to translate well when looking at breakthrough infections. Uh, Jessica Whittafield's group uh, from Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto used a test-native design to estimate vaccine effectiveness in those people with rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, and inflammatory bowel disease from the entire province of Ontario, Canada. Uh, they importantly only examined those with test results as opposed to assuming that anyone with no test results is negative, which reduces biases to patients with similar access to and indications for testing. On the left, you can see the incidence of breakthrough infections following the initial series of mRNA vaccination, which is around uh, 6%. On the right, you can see that the adjusted vaccine effectiveness in the last column, which is uh, uh, the numbers of which are similar to what was reported in the phase three clinical trials for mRNA vaccines uh, with immunocompetent in individuals, generally in the mid to high 90s percent. An important limitation in this analysis, though, or exclusions of diseases such as lupus and then associated vasculitis, where more potent immunosuppressives are used. And so we'll be covering this more specifically in a little bit. But I think for the majority of the patients that we see in our clinics on immunosuppression, we are seeing very promising results, both in terms of the immunogenicity, but also reduction in uh, breakthrough infections. <clears throat> so let's revisit and break down what we're seeing in our patients in B-cell depleting therapies and addressing the two questions listed here. Several groups have examined the timing from the last dose of B-cell depleting therapy to the time of vaccination, which led to this meta-analysis by the Rituxovac group in Bern, Switzerland. Generally speaking, on the left side, you can see that those vaccinated within six months of their last B-cell depleting dose possess poor human responses, while those who got vaccinated six months or more after their last dose of B-cell depleting therapy did much better as seen, as seen in these forest plots. Similar responses that were also noted for those without detectable peripheral blood B-cells versus those with detectable peripheral blood B-cells, and that's shown on the forest plot on the right. Some more granularity has been um, also identified, and this is uh, uh, shown by first uh, Thomas Dorner's group, who that identified that um, the a threshold of 10 cell peripheral B cells in the blood per microliter or higher best associated with human responses. And then furthermore, uh, the presence of peripheral naive B cells in, in particular was important. And this was demonstrated by another publication by Martin Strader's group in Austria. <clears throat> 
So ever since these data started to emerge, there have been a lot of questions about whether T cells can rescue <clears throat> when human humoral immunity is so badly attenuated. Uh, Socrates Apostolidis, an instructor in rheumatology at Penn and a postdoc in John Wary's group, has shown that in multiple sclerosis patients treated B with B cell depleted therapies, yes, memory B cells are reduced in the setting of B cell uh, depleting therapies as shown in the uh, uh, bar graph on the left side, focusing on, say, the T3 time point, which is going to be right after the second dose of, of vaccine. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, when you start looking at B, the middle and the right column uh, uh, figures, the conventional follicular helper T cell compartments, which is another critical component in uh, generating um, optimizing optimized B cell responses, they appear to be intact, at least quantitatively. Um, not shown here also in B cell depleted therapy uh, people is that CD8 positive T cells are also dramatically increased. And this was also shown in another study uh, done by uh, the, the NYU Erlogan cohorts um, led by Jose Scher and Georg Shedd. So recently, functional studies on T cells from B cell depleted therapy users has been published. Uh, these data come from a Swiss cohort of patients with multiple sclerosis on either rituximab or ocrelizumab. <clears throat> AIM on the left side here stands for activation-induced markers. These are a, a canonical signature of cell surface proteins that are upregulated following T cell activation, either for CD4 positive T cells on the upper left-hand side or CD8 positive T cells on the bottom left-hand side. Generally speaking, you can actually see there's a modest increase in both a CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells with AIM in both rituximab and ocrelizumab users. Now, potentially more interesting is the cytokine responses in CD4 positive um, activated T cells. And this is shown in this relatively complicated dot plot in the uh, right side of the slide. Generally speaking, similar frequencies of T cells that secrete interferon gamma, TNF alpha, IL2, were also observed in B cell depleted therapy users uh, compared to those um, that were on control, uh, that were um, uh, control patients. Again, so these data in combination suggest that T cell responses are generated and appear to be functional against spike antigen following vaccination. Now, if we have these T cells and they appear to be functional, could this be protected against breakthrough infections? The answer to this is probably that they're not sufficient, at least in the absence of humoral responses. Numerous observations have been made demonstrating increased breakthrough infection risk in patients with B cell depleted therapy. Uh, Jean Liu led the initial effort to characterize the incidence of breakthrough infections in the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance Registry. And indeed, those on B cell depleted therapies had the highest rate of breakthrough infections, including three deaths that were only observed in this particular group. Additionally, uh, most people are going to be aware of data um, uh, generated by Cassie and Len and their entire effort at the Cleveland Clinic that B cell depleted therapy users um, just over half of the study participants analyzed require hospitalization due to COVID-19, a number that's dramatically reduced when monoclonal antibody therapy was administered, again, confirming the sufficiency of neutralizing antibodies. You know, the totality of the data, again, it suggests to me that T-cells simply do not offer um, or appear to um, generate a sufficient protective response, at least not without a, hum a decent human response. Again, this is heavily confounded by um, other issues about T cells that we may not be measuring quite yet. So again, the, the jury is still a little bit out, but I'm not confident T cells are gonna be sufficient within this population to protect. So why not just keep giving more vaccine, right? This is the solution we've been telling everyone. <clears throat> Provide additional doses of vaccines to uh, patients who are at high risk of having poor uh, human immunity. So this question was examined in Norwegian, Norvax uh, cohort led by Ingrid Jensen. All study participants had rheumatoid arthritis, and they looked at post-third dose antibody titer rates in those with poor or no response after the initial series of mRNA vaccine. As you can see here on the left, the vast majority of the patients analyzed still had poor or absent antibody titers after the third dose. Now, <clears throat> they make a statistical argument on the right side, on the forest plots, that most of the responders following third dose were eight months out or more from their last rituximab dose compared to the non-responders, which averaged out about six months. This doesn't really pass the eye test in my view, and I'm not sure if this is actually indeed true. But I think the overall you know, arch, uh, overarching issue here is that 
For our B cell depleted therapy people that don't respond well to an initial series of vaccination, they may not experience substantial benefit with additional dosing. Again, more studies regarding the timing from the last B cell depleting dose are really needed, though, in this specific situation. All right, so let's switch over to another vulnerable uh, population, those of mycophenolate, uh, with regard to attenuated immune responses following vaccination. Here, the story appears to be more optimistic. This is an interesting story to me, uh, not because the use of mycophenolic uh, acid um, or mycophenolate mofetil was associated with a potent reduction in antibody levels. It, it, it is, and at least in our cohort, there was at least a 20-fold reduction in humoral antibody levels uh, compared to those who are with um, who are in the competent uh, uh, controls, and this is shown in that second to uh, last column in this figure. Um, but the experience from the solid organ transplant population may extrapolate to the mycophenolate user, and it's um, it, it's an interesting story. So I'm going to bring up these data from uh, the uh, kidney transplant population as a reminder of how potent some of our immunosuppressive medications are. So remember, if you have a solid organ tra transplant, you are on some substantial immunosuppression. You're on calcium neuroinhibitors, you're on glucocorticoids, mycophenolate, mTOR inhibition. Generally, most of these patients mount very poor antibody responses after the initial series of mRNA vaccines. And this was best de demonstrated very early on uh, following the uh, release of the vaccine uh, by Dory Segev's group at Johns Hopkins, where of 46% of the solid organ transplant patients analyzed in their cohort mounted no responses whatsoever. This number decreases in the mid-30s after the third dose in several studies. But worrisomely, over half of those with no response after two doses still had no response after three doses. So a key immune feature that both diversifies and optimizes antibody response, both in terms of quantity and quality of antibodies, is the germinal center response. And this is, occurs in lymph nodes and spleens, where he, uh, there are three different cell types, B cells, follicular helper T cells, and follicular dendritic cells, all of which are creating the germinal center response. <clears throat> now, almost all studies examining the uh, immune-mediated inflammatory disease population did not directly examine germinal center responses in draining lymph nodes, as this requires an accidentally lymph node aspiration to be able to pull out cells that are participating in germinal center responses. But data from this department is available in the kidney transplant space, which has been published in this exceptional cell paper by Mikhail Lochi's group at Penn. Now, specific medications that these kidney transplant patients were on were not explicitly provided in the paper. But again, let's assume that these patients were on some combination of potent immune suppression, again, including mycophenolate, glucocorticoids, mTOR inhibition, calcium neuron inhibitors. So within the setting, interestingly enough, profound abnormalities in several key uh, cellular players for germinal central responses were observed following the initial series of mRNA vaccine. And this is labeled in, V3, in the V3 column with controls and circles and kidney transplant uh, uh, participants in the triangles. There was a nearly complete absence of uh, germinal center B cells as shown in C, follicular helper T cells shown in H, antibody producing sp uh, cells specific to either whole spike protein or the R uh, receptor binding domain of spike protein, and that's shown in G. And then unsurprisingly, neutralized the antibodies to both common variant and beta variant, both in J and K respectively um, were uh, gone. Now, most of our patients aren't going to be on such profound combinations of therapies, um, but we have to be aware that certainly reductions in germinal center reaction efficiency may be contributing to poor protective responses. Okay, so for now, the optimistic part. And data that's a little bit surprising to me, within the solid organ transplant population, additional doses does seem to be beneficial. These data are from France, where investigators specifically examined those with antibody levels lower than a model threshold to correlate with the presence of protective neutralizing antibody titers. And this is shown in this dotted line, a um, little bit over the 100 on the y-axis. You can see that 50% of these participants who are below that threshold following three doses of vaccine had now had levels above that threshold with the fourth dose. Um, you know, I, I think this brings up an interesting and critical point, especially for those at high risk of poor responses that's not B cell uh, depleted therapy uh, uh, generated. Uh, we really need to keep pushing them to get these extra doses. I mean, even in the solid organ transplant space, you can get poor responders to mount what are probably effective antibody titers with that fourth dose. Um, what's going on here is really curious to me. 
um, if germline center responses um, are created in order to generate these good antibody responses, how do they establish themselves? Because it's pretty clear from the, the Michalolochi's group that they are not there after the second response. And if these are germline center responses, you know, how does that occur when the medications aren't held, which is you know, typically the case in the transplant world? Um, how do the immunosuppressive benefits for these patients with, with organ transplants, how is that maintained while developing immunogenicity to a vaccine? There's a lot of interesting mechanistic questions here uh, that's going to require um, more intensive study and most likely um, obtaining tissue uh, that we typically don't attain um, in our vaccine studies. Okay, so let's wrap up with um, the TNF inhibitor story because uh, this is another surprising story with admittedly unclear clinical consequences. <laughs> when we started our Corveripat study, uh, which along with many other groups globally sought to determine the immunogenicity and reactogenicity of SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in the patients that we treat, my primary interest actually was seeing whether or not antibody quality was going to be hit hard by the immunosuppressants that we use. Since this is something we don't really routinely measure even in research studies um, in, in, uh, with, say, influenza. So we teamed up with Mike Diamond's group at, at WashU, specifically Ria Chenu, who was an MDPG student at WashU in his lab, to look at which immunosuppressant classes impaired antibody quality. <clears throat> the too long didn't read. Ria found that TNF inhibitor, mon mon TNF inhibitor monotherapy use was the most associated with poor cross-variant neutralization. So on this slide, um, what I show our total anti-spike antibody titer. So this would be a combination of both neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies in various subsets of our participants in Coveripad shown in each letter against whole spike protein from each variant. So this is represented in different colors in each dot plot. Of note, in C through G, these are all monotherapy. We didn't want to be confounded at this time with combination therapies. So generally, we did not see any differences in geometric mean antibody titers in any of these groups three months post-vaccination, the most being a reduction of a third or so compared to immunocompetent controls, regardless of which variant was examined. Now, when you look at specifically neutralization antibody titers, and this is using fully infectious clinical isolates of various SARS-CoV-2 variants. So D614G is the common variant. Uh, the B.1.351 is going to be beta. And then at this time, uh, Delta was uh, the prominent uh, variant. So that's going to be the B.1.617.2. A different picture emerged here. Certain classes of medications, particularly TNF inhibitors, appear to have much lower cross variant neutralization tires compared to the other classes and certainly the immunocompetent controls. So using a, a neutralization titer threshold of 1 over 54, which was determined by Miles Davenport's group in Australia, when they examined the relationship between in vitro neutralization titers and protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection from the several phase three clinical trials that were performed, the fraction of immunocompetent controls at three months post-vaccination, and this is going to be the left side of data circled in the red uh, 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 ovals, um, in the when you look at delta variant cross variant neutralization, three months post vaccination, immunocompetent control, uh, um, only 8% of that population was below that threshold. In contrast, a little over a third of the participants in the uh, uh, chronic inflammatory disease group fell below this threshold. But the greatest reduction was those observed um, uh, on um, TNF inhibitor monotherapy, which was two thirds of the group. Remember, I just showed you that most of these people did have anti spike antibodies. So what this is suggesting is either impaired germline center responses, which helps diversify um, antibody responses. So when GC responses are impaired, you aren't able to diversify your antibody responses. And as a result, you can't cross variant neutralize. Or B, there's a loss of antibody secreting cells that possess neutralizing cross variant responses. Um, regardless, we see the worst uh, outcomes, uh, worst numbers <clears throat> in those on TNF inhibitors. Those on antimetabolites only, hydroxychloroquine only, NSAIDs only, or IL-23 inhibition only, only had much uh, more modest issues with in vitro cross-variant neutralization. On the right side are five, month, five to six month data, a post second dose of vaccination. And general worsening was observed in all groups. 17% of the immunocompetent controls were below this estimated threshold. Over half in the chronic inflammatory disease group were also below, below the threshold. And though although sample sizes are still small here, 
all TNF inhibitor monotherapy users, 100% of them were below that threshold at this time point. So you know, these signals suggest that while in vitro uh, cross-variant neutralization, at least against Delta, appears to be generally reduced on uh, those with EM suppression, those who are on TNF inhibitor are potentially in a unique disadvantageous uh, position. Another thing Rita checked was antibody effector function, um, uh, along with FC receptor binding and antibody titers to various in, uh, uh, antibody titers of various immunoglobulin isotypes. What's most noticeable was a reduction in FC effector function, specifically antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis and complement fixation in the TNF inhibitor users uniquely. It's not clear to me what clinical impact this has in terms of protective human immunity, but there are many nuances to immunogenicity that extends past just measuring neutralizing titers. For example, sotrovimab, whose uh, FDA EUA was revoked when Omicron variant came out because it couldn't neutralize that variant in vitro, it's clear that it was, it was able to still clear Omicron virus in mouse, mammals, mouse models in vivo uh, through its FC effector, uh, effector functions, even though it couldn't neutralize. And I listed that reference on the bottom right of this slide. So again, this is something we've never really examined in the past with antibody responses post-vaccination. Couple final thoughts here. So what was reassuring with the pre-Omicron uh, time period was that if we gave these TNF inhibitor users uh, a third dose of vaccine, they were able to finally uh, generate robust cross-variant neutralizing antibody titers to all the variants that we assessed. Now, we published this prior to Omicron. Omicron is a unique variant due to its highly immune evasive mutations. Uh, remember, for example, the XBB subvariant that came from Singapore, whose population was over 95% double vaccinated. So that's how immune evasive this uh, uh, the Omicron generally is. So here, there would be a theoretical risk to those on TNF inhibitors due to poor antibody repertory diversification, which would then blunt cross-variant neutralization. Um, and so we would hypothesize that TNF inhibitor users would not experience a rise in Omicron-specific neutralizing antibody titers after an additional dose. This was confirmed by Bimba Hoyer's group in Germany, who examined the immunogenicity of the third dose of, of mRNA vaccine, but specifically looking at Omicron-specific responses. So contrary to our observations pre-Omicron, in her cohort, those on TNF inhibitors versus other DMARs versus uh, immunocompetent controls, she found that the responses were very blunted, both to total anti-spike IgG on the left side here, um, on, on the, on the yeah, left side, the far right panel labeled D7.3, which re represents seven days post third dose, but also to the B8.2 subvariant of Omicron in the pseudovirus neutralization assay as shown on the right dot plot. Uh, so what does this mean? It might make sense in the context of the combination of a highly immune invasive variant potentially thriving in the host that cannot fully diversify antibody repertoires such as those on TNF inhibitors. But clinically, I'm not sure how to frame this yet, at least within the context of COVID. We are in the process of formally examining how blunted B cell receptor repertoire diversification is in these patients. Again, all of these are theoretical uh, threats uh, for these patients, but again, the clinical implications I think are still a little bit unclear. So just to wrap up here, <clears throat> we've talked about the impact of immune suppression and vaccine-induced immunity. In those people on B-cell depleting therapies, you, you know, it seems reasonable to wait at least six months, if not longer, to redose. Might be possible for a lot of our patients, with exception of maybe the ankyl-associated vasculitis patients. Um, those patients, it seems like, you know, if you delay, um, you know, beyond six months, in our experience, uh, the, the, um, the outcomes aren't as great for their ankyl-associated vasculitis. Can T cells alone provide protective immunity? It doesn't appear so. Mycophenolate, a happier story. It seems like you can just bully the immune system, the immune suppression, the immune suppression aside by giving more doses. Uh, it seems like the more doses you give, the greater percentage of the uh, solid organ transplant population are able to generate protective responses. And then we just talked about TNF inhibition. Antibody quality is clearly blunted. What's that mean clinically? I think the answer is still unclear. So I appreciate the attention. I look forward to addressing questions in the Q&A. Thanks.